In the peaceful early morning hours of August 8, 2007, Manling Williams returns to her home in Roland Heights, California, only to run back outside, screaming at the top of her lungs, running from neighbor to neighbor. A 19-year-old boy familiar with the family rushes to Manling's side. She pleads with him to please go back inside and check on her family. Without thinking about his own safety, he goes in. After sweeping the living room and then the kitchen, he races upstairs to where the bedrooms were located. At the top of the stairs, the boy is horrified to see the body of his neighbor, 27-year-old Neil Williams, laying in a pool of blood covered with stab wounds. But the boy knew two young sons were also in the house that he needed to find right away. He had to step over Neil's body to enter the boys' room. He finds the boys laying peacefully on their beds. He called out to three-year-old Ian, but he didn't get a response. And then he calls out to seven-year-old Devin, but he too lay silent. Once the police and paramedics arrived, they pronounced all three of them dead. Neil Williams is described by those closest to him as the best kind of person you'd want as a friend. Never spoke ill about people, comfortable to be around, and if you were lucky enough to be his friend, he would take care of you and had your back 100%. A science fiction nerd at heart that loved Star Wars and Cars. Manling Sang was a proud band geek, playing trombone in the high school band. Friends described her as being very bubbly and friendly. Even though she came from a disciplinary household, being the youngest, her friends would joke she still managed to be spoiled. And to anyone that knew her, knew that she loved being the center of attention. In 1997, Neil and Man Ling found themselves hanging out with the same group of friends. The two became close and by the following year started dating. Another year would pass and in 1999, Neil and Man Ling, who were just 19 at the time, faced a real life crisis. Man Ling was pregnant. But they accepted responsibility and in July of 2000, they welcomed Devin Williams into the world. Shortly after his birth, they were married later that same year. Three years later, in September of 2003, they had their second boy and named him Ian. To their group of friends, Neil and Manling had the perfect family. They had a nice home, two wonderful boys, and didn't need much to be happy. Neil being a janitor at Disneyland and Manling a waitress at Marie Callender's restaurant, as you could imagine, didn't afford them many luxuries, but they were happy. To say that the boys meant everything to Neil would be an understatement. Neighbors would see him out on the front lawn, running around with his boys, playing catch, acting out Star Wars, and all you had to do was watch to see a very devoted father that found tremendous joy in his family. At least Neil was happy with what they had. One day he confides in his best friend that Man Ling was unhappy about their finances, and Neil being the people pleaser that he is, puts it upon himself to make more money. He quits his janitor job and gets a high paying one as a life insurance salesman. The only problem was, for this job to be high paying, you actually had to sell life insurance, and Neil found out quickly that his low key reserved personality wasn't selling anything, so now he wasn't making any money at all. This would be a good time to let you in on how a childhood friend, one that knew Manling since kindergarten and all throughout high school, actually thinks of her. The side of her that she didn't readily display for people to see. She starts by describing her as very moody, emotionally unstable to say the least, extremely foul mouth. Overall, she was very troubled that the sweet girl act was just that an act to get what she wanted and what she wanted was everyone to think that she was perfect because she loved attention. So as the money in the household grew tighter, the real man Ling started to appear as she became more verbally abusive towards Neil and major cracks in what looked to be the perfect marriage started to appear. Remember when I mentioned that man Ling loves attention? Let's just say that if you were a man that showed her that attention, well, she might just show you that attention right back. She wound up having several affairs, mainly with co-workers, and the saddest part was 
Neil knew about some of them, but chose to ignore it because he was committed to making it a happy home for his boys. But she had an even deeper secret. She had this unhealthy infatuation with a boy she used to date in high school named John. The breakup shook up her world at the time and she never got over it. Even though several years have passed, John was always in her thoughts. And it was one day, while sitting at her laptop, she searched for his name and found his MySpace page, sends him a message, and when she receives a reply, we can assert that this is the moment Manling starts to detach herself from her family, seeing them more as a burden, an obstacle, and starts living in the fantasy world of what ifs. So, a growing resentment for her husband started to weigh on the relationship as arguments began to become more frequent. And the more frequent they got, the louder they got, until the yelling and door slamming reverberated throughout the neighborhood. Neighbors remember seeing Man Ling standing outside smoking cigarette after cigarette after some of these arguments. One night, Man Ling actually tried to do the right thing and demands a divorce. Neil vehemently pleads with her to not do it because he was from a broken home and he will do anything to keep his boys from experiencing the same thing. As we can see, Neil's first concern was not for himself, but for his boys. For Man Ling, on the cusp of reuniting with an old fling, was prepared to throw them all away. But Neil was able to convince her that night to stay in that marriage, if only for the boys. Now Manling and John had yet to reconnect physically up to this point, since John was now living in Santa Barbara, 121 miles away from her home in Roland Heights. But that was about to change, as their messages became more passionate. She was compelled to take the next step, so she planned out a weekend trip to see him, under the guise of a business trip. A business trip for a waitress. Now don't get me wrong, I respect servers, but let's be real. I don't think corporate is planning an all expense paid trip for the wait staff. To teach what? How to push more lemon meringue pie? Which at Marie Callender's is top notch? No, you train the managers to do that and then they train the staff. So I can imagine Neil really had to turn a blind eye to this story because even his best friend told him that it made no sense. But if he wanted peace in the house, what could he do? Manling books a ticket and flies to Santa Barbara. Here's all you need to know about Santa Barbara. It's a beautiful coastal city in California designed for the rich. And once she arrived, she was now experiencing the lavish life that could have been with the man that she's been obsessed with. The one that got away. So for that weekend, she was in pure bliss. On the final night of paradise, she tells John how amazing it all was and that she was going to come back the following weekend. Now I'm going to bet that weekend didn't mean nearly as much to John as it did to Man Ling. To give you further reference to their actual history, what they had in high school lasted only two weeks. That technically can be labeled as just a fling. Now, in any breakup, it's more likely that the person being broken up with will have a harder time letting go. So it's safe to assume that John broke it off that first time in high school. And I say that to say this. And let me just put it bluntly. John just wanted some ass in high school and he just wanted some ass for that weekend. And now let's notice a pattern. Once he got what he wanted the first time, he calls it off soon after. And now that he got what he wanted again, take a wild guess at what he's gonna do next. So when Madeline gets home, reality sets in and her mood shifts back to misery. And guess who was in her inbox that night? Finally, with a bout of guilt for being a homewrecker. You guessed it, it was John. His pattern is now complete, but instead of just cleanly breaking it off, he did the half-assed breakup where he left the slightest opening in that window. He said to the effect of, you said that you were unhappy in your marriage, but you never do anything about it. Once your divorce is final, then maybe we could rekindle our relationship. You never give a crazy bitch an open window. But how was John to know? Man Ling is completely devastated. Resentment had now turned to pure hate for her family. Her mind starts to go to dark places and a premeditated plot 
starts to unfold. She started insinuating to various friends that she was scared of Neil, that he was frustrated by his failures to support his family and was taking it out on her physically and verbally. When the news travels to Neil's best friend, considering what Neil had told him before, he knew that things weren't adding up. But she continued to plant the seeds, describing to another friend a dream that she had in which Neil had murdered their boys and then committed suicide. Once she was satisfied that her stories had permeated the entire group, she set out to complete the final act. I feel the need to warn any of you watching that may be sensitive to crimes committed to children. Please, click away now. So on the night of August 7th, Manling deliberately gets Neil to drink alcohol, knowing that it would get him extremely sleepy. So when he disappears into their bedroom, she puts on a pair of gloves and starts climbing the stairs towards Ian and Devin's room. Three-year-old Ian was sleeping on the bottom bunk. Now Ian is your typical toddler, running around, getting into mischief, very clever as well as no baby gate could hold him for any period of time, a little ball of energy that loved hide and seek. So Manling takes his pillow and presses it over his face as he starts to cry and struggle. It takes an average of seven minutes to suffocate a human being, a long grueling death and she had plenty of time to reconsider but she doesn't. When Ian no longer struggled and his arms went limp, she climbs to the top bunk where she finds seven-year-old Devin already awake and scared of the strange muffled noises he just heard. Now Devin was described as an extremely bright child. He was good at board games and just loved interacting with people. He wanted to be an archaeologist when he grew up because he just loved dinosaurs so much. But the next few minutes with his mother would end all those dreams. And what she did after shows how unaffected she was by what she just did. She opens her laptop, logs into her MySpace page just to see if John sent her a message and then lingered on his homepage for a while and then closes the laptop. She also takes this time to confirm a happy hour with co-workers at TGIF. Now TGIF was part of her alibi to this devious plot in which I believe you're not going to be able to guess how she thought this night would play out after having murdered her two sons and putting her husband to an inebriated sleep. Because hopefully you're not a psychotic, but go ahead. Try to take a guess if you don't already know how she thought this night would play out. Pause the video and go ahead. Don't forget to subscribe. So how she thought this situation would play out was, after suffocating her boys, she would go out to TGIF and just have a magnificent time until all hours of the night, until 4 a.m. to be more specific, because she wanted to allow as much time as possible for Neil to wake up, check on the boys, realize that they were dead, and then commit suicide out of sheer grief. Then she could blame all the deaths on Neil. Now does that sound right to you? How about Neil finds his kids unresponsive and calls the paramedics first? That's what a rational person would think. So after TGIF, she arrives home at about 4 a.m. and found that her plan did not pan out. She puts on another pair of gloves and enters the bedroom to find Neil still fast asleep. Unfortunately for him, their bedroom was decorated with his collection of samurai swords, an obsession of his that annoyed Manling to no end, which now had her hatred of him reaching a fever pitch. She grabs the heaviest and sharpest sword with a 10-inch handle and 20-inch blade. She raises it and brings it down. The pain jolts Neil awake. She continues to stab and strike Neil as he falls off the bed and hurriedly scrambles away. Manling continues to follow him and relentlessly hack and chop away at his head and body as he crawled. And Neil would eventually succumb to his injuries just shy of Ian and Devin's room by the stairway. It was clear by his path 
that with every ounce of life he had left, his only thought was to protect his boys. She had struck him with the sword a total of 97 times. Man Lin cleans off the sword and carefully bags up all her bloody clothes, goes into the restroom and takes a shower. She puts on boxer shorts and a t-shirt and went outside to put the bag of bloody clothes in the car. By now it's about 5 a.m. She meets some early bird neighbors and has a quick chat with them about not being able to sleep and was going to take a leisurely drive. What she actually does was find a far off secluded place to throw away the bloody bag. And while she was there, she enjoys the first sunrise of her newfound freedom. When she arrives back home, she gets out of the car and enters the house to rediscover her dead husband's body. She takes a deep breath because this had to be the performance of a lifetime and starts screaming frantically, runs out the front door, screaming as the neighbors come out, screaming as the police show up, screaming as the paramedics arrive. She never stops her over-the-top display of grief. Her friends eventually show up, the ones she planted the awful seeds about Neil's abuse. So Neil, who they've always known to be the nicest, most caring guy on earth, now, according to Man Ling, had finally gone too far. You hacked up your husband over 90 times. What the fuck makes you think anyone with eyeballs will see this as a suicide? He has cuts on the back of his head and body. You dumb bitch. The dramatic crying, the dry heaving would all raise eyebrows because police noticed that absolutely zero tears were being shed. The first of numerous red flags that they would note that night such as when she asked a policeman who had just come out of the house if her husband and boys will be okay. A rather absurd question considering she was the one that found her husband's body and there was no way to look at him and think that he was okay. So already highly suspicious, the policeman simply answered, no, they are not okay. Which kicks Manling's despair into high gear, wailing a bit louder, moving a bit more frantically, and to top it all off, knocking over trash cans, raising more eyebrows and red flags. When detectives enter the home, Things were in such disarray, they at first believed it was a robbery, not knowing that this was the normal state of the household these days. Detectives found a laptop sitting on a table. They opened the screen and found that it was still on, and there was a document still open. Typed out under Neil's name, it was a suicide note. The gist of it was that he was really sorry he had to kill the boys and himself. Upon further inspection of the laptop, they confirmed it belonged to Man Ling. Her concerning behavior was enough for police to order Man Ling into custody, releasing this statement to the public. We placed the wife under arrest. She did make several incriminating statements. So Man Ling was being held without bail as the story of her whereabouts when the murders occurred started to conflict. Neighbors who saw Man Ling earlier that morning said that she told them she couldn't sleep so she was going to take a drive. This contradicted Man Ling's first statement to investigators that she had gone to a nearby liquor store for Red Bull and cigarettes. Then, after being taken down to the station where she would be interviewed by homicide, her story changed again to grocery shopping for breakfast and then returned an hour later to find the bodies. Witnesses at the scene also noted that Man Ling was wearing nothing but boxer shorts, a t-shirt, and no shoes. Not something you would wear to the store. But forget all the red flags, because while she was down at the station, her poorly planned murder was falling apart, because in the front yard, police find a cigarette butt with blood stains on the filter. Upon inspecting Manling's car, they find a pack of camel cigarettes with traces of blood on the box. That DNA would prove to be Neil's on both items and Manling's saliva as having smoked the cigarette. So how did this happen? So when she was chopping at her husband, she was getting sprayed with blood splatter. It seeped through her clothes and onto her cigarettes. So when she goes to take that shower, she simply takes that pack of cigarettes out and when she's done, takes that pack with her. She has a smoke just before getting in the car 
flicks the butt away and tosses the pack into the car and leaves to meet with her co-workers. Now get this guys, when she was presented with the opportunity to explain how Neil's blood got onto the cigarette she smoked as well as the box in the car, detective said that Manling straight up froze and you could almost see her mind racing for a plausible answer. But of course, she wasn't going to be able to come up with one because it's just absurd. Instead, she asked this. Should I get a lawyer or should I just come clean? She said that. I guess the dumbest murder-suicide frame job deserves to be capped off with the dumbest question to ask an interrogator. Of course, the interrogator urged her to come clean and she confessed to the entire thing. A jury would find her unanimously guilty of parricide, family annihilation, and deemed it egregious enough to be sentenced to death in 2012 to be served at the California Women's Facility of Chowchilla. Considering California's last execution was in 2006, Manling Williams will probably spend the remainder of her life in prison instead. I hope this video earned your subscription. If not, at least a like for the time spent to make it. Hope you enjoyed the case tonight, Dad. I love you, and I'll see you soon with another.